Here we go, folks. It's top 10 unusual facts about the D.B. Cooper disappearance. <gasps> Whoa. Number 10, he was never found. November 1971 was a day just like any other. It was the 70s, so life was good, or so that's what I'm told from people who lived through the 70s. I don't know, I wasn't there. An airplane was flying from Oregon to Seattle. This is where our main character appropriated the vehicle for himself, where he managed to ransom $200,000 cash. Then, like a true nutcase, jumped out of said airplane and parachuted to safety. More on that later. To this day, we have no idea who D.B. Cooper was. All we know is that some of the ransom money was found by a river in 1980. Again, more on that later. Which did spark new interest, but not a lot of new leads. All we really do know is that he bought the airline ticket with cash under the name Dan Cooper, or D.B. Cooper. Multiple theories exist about who he may be, including a man named Richard Fly McCoy, who had done similar crimes. The FBI isn't convinced as today DB Cooper remains the only air piracy case still unsolved. Number nine, the name's Bond, James Bond. Ah, sure, it lost. Part of the mystery or fascination of the D.B. Cooper case is how slick it was, how it went so smooth, oh yes, almost without a hitch, very similar to the aerial escapades of a certain MI6 spy. The comparisons are pretty easy to make, especially when you consider what the man was wearing at the time, a full black suit and tie with a black briefcase. According to witnesses on the scene, he had a very pleasant and charming demeanor, Ooh, just like Mr. Bond, yes. Older Ordered two bourbons from the booze cart, paid his bill, and even offered to tip the flight attendant. Very Sean Connery of you, yes. <laughs> even during the theft of the plane, he kept his cool as he instructed pilots to fly low in order for him to complete his jump from the plane. That's just what a crazy story. Number eight, fake agent. This is too strange not to talk about. So two weeks before the D.B. Cooper incident, a man on another plane sat down with some pilots. Now this, this was the 70s, so you know, you could do that if you were smooth enough and wealthy enough. While he was there, he was telling the pilots that he was a big shot in the movie business and was asking aviation questions relating to a low dropping out of a plane and landing in a specific spot. For a movie, yeah, that makes sense, sure. For a movie he was helping to make, even handing out a pamphlet of the movie. The non-existent movie, hmm, weird. The man's description matched that of a witness who saw D.B. Cooper at that incident. When the pilots of the plane with the movie mogul were interviewed, they couldn't remember the name of the movie, pamphlet, or that of the man that they let sit with them. That sounds like an inside job, I don't know. It's weird, that's weird. Number seven, rest in peace. A good reason no one has ever heard or saw him again is that there's a slight chance he didn't make it. And by slight, I mean a good chance he didn't make it. Okay, let's say you were going to jump out of a plane at night, carrying pounds and pounds of cold hard cash with you. If you've ever played Payday, you know what I'm talking about. It's heavy. And you're flying low to the ground with low visibility. You wouldn't have much time to maneuver your parachute. Then you have to deal with being in the middle of the Washington wilderness. This is the 1970s, so that means no cell phones, no GPS. Some experts believe he perished in the fall or the wilderness claimed him. No one's really sure. The only thing I can think of is that maybe he had a map and some small survival gear in his briefcase instead of what he actually said he had in there. At least enough to get him out of the woods and then back to civilization. I think, that's my theory, I don't know. Number six, interview. In 1972, the Seattle flag held an interview with a man claiming to be the man who made the daring criminal escapade. Their evidence was that they had one of the $20 bills he stole from the plane. The paper also claimed that they had gone to great lengths to confirm that this was in fact the crook they were looking for. This is the crook you're looking for. But I also used to tell Miss Middleton in English class that I read the books that she assigned for the class, when in reality I used cliff notes and then only read about five pages of the book. I'm sorry, it just wasn't happening. Then I charmed the rest of my way through her class. Yeah, nice, great. The interview is interesting as the mystery man claims there was no accomplice on the ground and that he will return after five years when the statute of limitations expired. Yeah, I don't know if that's gonna happen, dude. You, you're gonna do a crime and come back five years later? You can't just. Doesn't work like that. Can't do that. Number five, plot device. If you're gonna take something away from all of this, I guess it's that, well, it just makes a good story. Heck, it's why I'm standing here before you today. It shouldn't come as a surprise that D.B. Cooper gets used as a theme or plot device in Hollywood. 
It's naturally a good story. So all you have to do is add like, I don't know, say for example, three estranged friends going on a camping trip to honor the loss of their fourth buddy. But after a menagerie of misfortunes bestow upon them in the forest, they come across the remains of D.B. Cooper and his fortune. Poor guys were up a creep without a paddle. What would we call that movie, huh? He's been mentioned in books, shows, movies, and for me, one of the silliest quips from Saul Goodman is him describing Walter's Heisenberg attire as D.B. Cooper. Why so mysterious, D.B. Cooper. Number four, lost loot. In February of 1980, as I mentioned before, a few months shy of a decade since the caper had been done, some bundled money was found near Vancouver, Washington. Naturally, they had degraded over time because, well, it's paper money and water and just makes sense. The vending machine wasn't going to accept them, but after some thorough investigation, it was confirmed that the money did in fact belong to the stash that he stole. It seems though that this brought up more questions than answers. How did the bills end up on the riverbank? When did they wash up? Why did they wash up? How did they wash up? And why did one of the three stacks only have 90 bills instead of 100 like the other stacks? That doesn't make any sense, what? In better news though, the kid who stumbled across the money got to keep it and in 2008 sold it at auction for a small fortune of his own. So there's some good news, I like that. That's good news, we like that. Number three, copycats. This happens with a lot of capers, crimes, or well, just, just craziness in general. Crazy makes crazy. In the D.B. Cooper case, it made a lot of crazy. In 1972 alone, 15 copycat attempts were made, and some of them were more successful than you might think, or at least hope to. The most unusual was done by a man named Frank Manahan. In 1972, Frank took over a plane from Pennsylvania and asked for $303,000. Cigarettes, food, parachutes, knives, and a helmet, because, yeah, that's what you need. When they landed, he let everyone off except for six crew members, and when he was given his cash, decided that 100 bills uh, simply wasn't a large enough denomination, and demanded the pilot fly back up. Sure, okay. Eventually, he jumped out of the plane, just like D.B. Cooper did, except he was over the Honduras jungle. It didn't go very well, because he turned himself in after weeks on the run in the jungle. So, you know, maybe pick Washington's a little bit better in the jungle, I guess. Uh, you know? I don't know. Number two, security. After the files for people stealing money and jumping out of airplanes started piling up on the FBI's desk, it was clear that things needed to change. I mean, come on, 15 cases in one year, it's a little much. So in 1973, bag checks and security were done for the first time in airports across America. Hard to ever imagine an airport without them, really. Airplanes were built much more securely and peepholes were added. So you could see what was going on between the cabin and the main area. Most importantly, I think, is now that you, you can't open airplane doors on passenger aircraft whilst it is in the air, mainly because of the D.B. Cooper incident. So in case you try to go for a little, uh, little fly zone, you can't do it. Can't do it, dude, because of him. Sorry, man, you ruined it for you. Number one, still alive, sort of. Robert Rackstraw, a Vietnam vet who was arrested in 1978 for trying to fake his own death and a subject of a book that highlights his aerial escapes. Not to mention his uncanny likeness to be D.B. Cooper, well, he was thought to actually be D.B. Cooper. All these clues certainly had the FBI intrigued, but even with his confession of being D.B. Cooper, they still weren't convinced. It's, it's just really too hard to tell. Robert passed away in 2019, so I guess we'll just never know. He confessed to it, but he didn't, you know what I mean? We need two confessions to, con to put someone away. That's how it works nowadays. Do need two. Anyways, guys, that's going to wrap it up for me today. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe here at Bumblebee for more. And if you too want to jump out of an airplane with me, then check out my social somewhere down below. Come on, give me a follow. Come on, over, Rover. I love you guys so much, and I'll see you soon. Stay sweet, my little honeybees.